Hello, and welcome to Poetry at the Dali. I'm Hank Hine, the museum director. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this series hosted by Helen Pruitt Wallace. Uh, today we're in for a very special program, and that is we are going to be discussing poetry and hearing poetry from Keith Flynn. Uh, as is our tradition, uh, with the help of the city of St. Petersburg, we ask Helen Wallace, the poet laureate of our city, to begin by reading one of her poems. Helen, welcome to Poetry at the Dali. Thank you so much, Hank, and thanks, Keith Flynn. Welcome um, to our series. I'm really excited that you're joining us, um, and thanks to all of you who are tuning in this evening. I will read one um, short poem. This is a poem I wrote about a year ago. Um, it was, of course, well after Hurricane Irma. And now, because as we are recording this, we are under a hurricane watch from Hurricane Etta. So um, this poem is called The Swerve. An egret lacerates the sky, its wings daubing a wound, the wind unstitches. We, with our sandbags, flashlights, duct tape to patch a torn world. Deliverance is a roll of the dice. We hear the bay howl, its mongrel song. The tide receding toward the gulf, inlets, mangroves abandoned. While we, wet sand, sun slick, and porous, reach like the back of a hand toward what? Our muck of desires, our slights, our barnacled fears. Bargaining won't work, just luck. We know an undertow of dread, night air hisses our name. We cover our world in plywood, shaking more grit from our hair as the storm, like a cosmic game, leaves its card at the door. So, you know, there's a lot in this poem about chance. And um, I think the week that we have just seen and the weeks ahead are a lot about chance as well, and a lot about will. Um, so, you know, congratulations to all of us for hanging in there and doing what we needed to do to get to the polls and vote. So I, I needed to add that to, um, to this evening's discussion. But again, I am so excited to have Keith Flynn here um, with us today. And you guys are really in for a treat when you hear all the various things that Keith can do. Um, he is the award-winning author of seven books, including six collections of poetry, most recently, The Skin of Meaning, um, which was published just this year through Red Hen um, Press. And by the way, you should get those books at Tombolo Books. Um, you can go to tombolobooks.com. Tombolo, if you're not familiar with it, is a really wonderful indie bookstore here in downtown St. Pete. Um, so please check it out and you'll find Keith's books there as well. Um, he's also written a wonderful collection of essays called The Rhythm Method, Rosmataz and Memory, How to Make Your Poetry Swing. It was published by Writer's Digest in 2007. And I think we um, get to hear Keith talk about that book, especially a chapter in that book that's about Dali and, and Gala and um, their contribution to surrealism. So I'm looking forward very much to hearing um, Keith talk about that and read from that book. He was also a lyricist and lead singer for the nationally acclaimed rock band, The Crystal Zoo, uh, which produced three albums, Swing, Swimming Through Lake Erie, Pouch, and the spoken word and music compilation, Nervous Splendor. He's currently touring with supporting with, well, pre-pandemic, <laughs> um, with The Holy Men, whose album Live at the Di Diana Wortham Theater was released in 2011. He's the executive director and producer of the TV show Live at White Rock Hall, where he's um, currently being filmed. Um, so that's kind of cool to see that. And if you go to his website, you'll be able to see all kinds of neat images about that. And I hope he'll talk about um, where he is and, and what happens there at the hall. Um, his award-winning poetry and essays have appeared in all kinds of journals, too many to name all of them, but um, the American Literary Review, the Colorado Review, Poetry Wales, Five Points, many, many, Crazy Horse. Um, and he's been awarded the Sandberg Prize for Poetry, a 2013 North Carolina Literary Fellowship, the ASCAP Emerging Songwriter Prize, um, and more. 
Keith is the founder and managing editor at the Asheville Poetry Review, which began publishing in 1994. Please welcome Keith Lynn. Glad to have you here with us, Keith. Hey, thank you. Thank you so much, Helen. That was a absolutely very interesting poem that you read a moment ago. That I, thank you for reading that. Um, I love the, the first three lines, those amazing images of that egret uh, uh, stabbing his way through the sky. That's very, uh, that's really nice. Um, I'm coming to you guys from uh, White Rock Hall, which is about an hour northwest of Asheville, North Carolina, in uh, Western North Carolina. And um, the, um, um, I'm uh, in the studio. We picked this uh, church up and we moved it onto this 16 acre campus. Uh, it's a hundred year old church. Uh, and we jacked it up 18 feet. We built a first floor under it, and then we dropped the church down on top of that first floor. Um, and then the second floor, now where the sanctuary was, we have a soundstage and a recording studio. And the classrooms are now a big, huge uh, kitchen. And um, so we've got three floors, and uh, uh, what we try to do is we film a show here called Live at White Rock Hall. We bring in nationally known authors, we pair them with regional musicians, and then we film their collaborations live. So we're trying to create a poetry laboratory here where uh, we force people into things that they might not do otherwise, uh, into improvisational and collaborative uh, creative efforts uh, that create, hopefully, um, these constructs that are neither fish nor fowl. Uh, they might be, they might sound like a story one moment, then a poem, then a song, and I want to disorient the audience so that they never know exactly where it is they are. Um, but uh, this is this wall, this, this sign used to read White Rock Presbyterian Church and used to sit on the side of this church and it's former sitting. And that's why you, we have it here above my head now, uh, along with the two Indonesian masks on either side. So um, uh, thank you so much for the invitation to be here. And I, I really appreciate it, Helen. Um, a lot of what I'm going to speak about today are going to talk about uh, going to be more visual work because we are coming from the Dali Museum. Uh, I want to talk about how surrealism uh, creates unexpected associations uh, at all times. And as Breton used to say, raises the triangle of the spirit. Um, I'm going to start out with a poem. This is called, If You Are Chagall. If you are Chagall, then you believe that fish can thresh wheat. If you are Rodin, the gods are your playthings and their hands are perfect. The total work of art is achieved through the soul's inner necessity, the way music persuades without argument. And in this world, the horses want to stand on their back feet and walk like a man, towering over the human that has infuriated them. All the chimneys become holy relics and the hills raise their skirts in can-can, with the trees for legs and blue feet built from pools of water, kicking their heels as high as the light will allow. And from the shore, the boats are dwarfed, meager vessels whose eager travel is blown to molecules, notes of the sky that prompt the boiling ocean to pound all attempts to tame it. Gravity has long been banished from this kingdom where the moon is the only law and the horses walk upright into the waves. Their riders trail like birds in the barking wake because every horse is secretly, romantically involved with the sea. And when they sleep, they dream of whales flying unimpeded through the deep music, fish, Pity the cities. Um, so I'm going to do a couple of things now from uh, the, my new book, uh, The Skin of Meaning. Um, this is uh, the book that uh, came out in April. Uh, it does have a Picasso on the cover from his blue period. Um, and uh, Picasso and Dali are uh, been very important influences. Uh, on my work, and I'll talk about that a little bit more in just a second. Um, I, have a, uh, I had an accident about three or four years ago where I was burned pretty badly, uh, and my lower leg um, um, 
as all as all accidents happen, it was completely stupid. But um, uh, and what it, what did happen as a result is there are several poems with a fire motif that found their way into this book, and um, so I want to read a couple of those for you now. Again, pay attention to um, the metaphorical associations and the, the visuals of the poem. Um, this is called Portrait of the Artist as a Spark. Between the gas and the can, my lower leg disappeared in a blue and orange flame. Nothing is more articulate than fire. It moves in slow motion at the speed of light, a ragged language, raw and messy. It leaves a shattered chugging trail of shadows and debris, the charred coals of a formerly living thing. Fire never mutters. It barks with surprise, then shrieks and tears apart the precision of speech and leaves a soiled scar of broken sentences. Impaled on a spit, clarity returns to my mind in a burst. 35 years ago, what hung a flaming necktie round my tender brain and begged through the spindle of my body for some sudden flash of truth. Fire filled my veins. Poetry pulled me out by the roots. Um, there's another, uh, this one also maintains the uh, fire motif. Um, for just a second. Um, in the 19th century, um, most of the uh, performances for the opera, for um, plays, for uh, uh, chamber music performances or ballets were conducted on stages that were lit by these incandescent calcium oxide uh, configurations that had an open flame as the footlights. And so what uh, happened as a consequence of that is um, it created this sort of lime colored light. And so when performers were back uh, in the rear of the stage or stage left or right, uh, if they wanted to be seen or were delivering a particularly poignant moment in the uh, piece itself, they would walk to the front of the stage and be lit up uh, by those, that incandescent flame and they would be painted, they would be bathed in this lime color which eventually became known as being in the limelight. Um, and so slowly but surely that worked its way into our vernacular. Uh, the light was so bright that many times uh, the performers became a little disoriented uh, from the light and from being so bright in their vision. And they found that the way to calm that would be to go into a darker room that with a, still a green sort of emerald light uh, that would calm their vision so that they could go back out and perform. and that those rooms became known as the green room um, where performers, you know, got their act together or set and did their pre uh, pre show rituals. And then they came out into the stage. So those two uh, um, phrases, you know, became pretty prominent in uh, performing arts, being in the limelight and uh, uh, relaxing in the green room. Uh, the other unfortunate aspect of those footlights were because it was an open flame, uh, uh, in ballet in particular, ballerinas um, had uh, outfits and tutus that were all made of a, a very flammable tissue type material. And so as a consequence, many ballerinas who got too close to those lights caught on fire. And sometimes uh, the other performers would rush up to try to put the fire out. And as a consequence, they themselves would catch on fire. So um, um, it was a very dangerous thing. And this poem is a tribute to a ballerina who lost her life during the performance of Madame Butterfly. Um, her name was Emma Livry, L-I-V-R-Y. Um, and uh, this is a tribute to her. This is called Le Papillon. This is not the righteous blue flame that engulfs the monk or the sherbet agent of invisible acid dropped by the barrel on the naked children of starving villages in South Vietnam. This is not the 80 proof orange vodka cocktail lit by the free basing Richard Pryor, a black adder addled by self-loathing who poured the fire over his head and ran screaming into the void. 
This is not the match strike under the cooking spoonful any more than it is the convulsive propulsion shivering into massive tendrils that annihilate the bloated Hindenburg in an avalanche of star-like implosion, a fire that blotted out a flying cathedral between its fingers. No. This is the personal and public incineration, snapping its jaws shut around the most delicate, jubilant wings. This is the interrupted, gravity-free white lance that burns straight through the curtain, the laser emitted by a magnifying glass as it focuses a ray of the sun on an unsuspecting dragonfly, the wisp of smoke, almost a held breath of frost, lets slowly out, then the shards, red and jagged, slicing through the tutu's layers, and igniting them, delicate as tissue paper, sticking to the ballerina's hips as she twisted away from the guilty footlights and swarmed into the backstage, a thousand ingots of red and lavender knives exploding around her supple hands and shoulders, a galaxy of bees hiving her, a flare, a comet, and finally, a nest of ash, hoping to hold together in the wind. My, um, my father passed away about two weeks ago. Um, he was 82 years old. And um, I want to read a poem for him. And um, this is a, the title of the poem is from a Stanley Kubrick movie that, that never was made. Um, and the title is called Coffin Not Included. I want to uh, read a little piece of the blues. I want to sing a little piece of blues before I get into the reading of the poem, if that's all right. And um, um, we'll, uh, uh, we'll move one into the other. One of these days, and it won't be long. You look for me, Lord, and I'll be gone. I should have quit you, baby, a long time ago now. I should have quit you, baby. Gradually, the world shuts you out. Your plum skin dapples and craters, effectively exhausted by holding back the waterfall that is a human being. There's no getting used to sorrow. Every encounter, like the rungs of a ladder, lap higher and harder until the rails turn to eels in your hands and escape as ropes of smoke, weary of the body and its constant demands. The walls between this world and the next are leaky as an old rowboat. Heated commerce passes between them. A musical wind. Ribbons of distress wound into our bones by ghosts. Music can pass for conversation, says things not entirely human, beyond the realm of words. Notes hanging on their wires like unruffled birds. How we are usually complicit in the things we complain about, and yet we have so little control over what we create. Music makes me do just what it wants me to. And furry arroyos full of cactus shadows know that among the holies there is more than one ghost. I uh, 
wanted to talk a little bit about um, surrealism and about Dali and uh, Picasso. Um, there's a whole section in this book. This is called The Rhythm Method, Razzmatazz and Memory. And the whole middle section talks about um, the visualization of um, 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 poetry and how it is taken from the uh, avant-garde art starting with really with uh, Baudelaire in the mid 1830s and then worked his way through. Uh, he was a true sort of father of surrealism in a weird, strange way. And um, I wanted, uh, wanted to uh, talk a little bit about that and about, uh, Picasso sort of set the tone when the, they had the Armory Show in New York uh, in the early teens. Um, that was the first time that Americans had laid their eyes on any kind of surrealism. And in some ways it became this fugitive ism when it set up when it set itself against the, the new modernism that was taking place under the Jesus aegis of uh, um, Pound and Elliot and um, it really took uh, Dali making his way here in 1931 uh, with $500 that he had uh, borrowed from Picasso and um, they made their way here and um, was followed thereafter but he, he was immediately a sensation um, uh, when, when Dolly came here. And um, one of the things I think um, that uh, uh, Wallace Stevens said that reality is a cliche from which we escape by metaphor. And um, symbols evolve or emerge, I think by blurring the edges of contrasting imagery so that the reader cannot discriminate what is between what is real or what is unreal. The poem thus contains its own reality and guideposts that the reader can willingly follow. In fact, the po a poem lets in more of the world through its various comparisons uh, than almost any other way, except for its music, its rhythm. And a poem is language with a shape, a long piece of hungry momentum that flows unimpeded down the page. And that flow has to flow with authority. And that momentum has to cut its way through the, the whiteness of the page, what, what, what Hemingway called the white bull that I had to confront every day. Um, and um, poetry through this heightened imagery, through these unexpected associations, it always expands the scope of the world and it sort of enlarges our reality. It takes and moves the dust off the retinue of, the every, of our everyday lenses and shows us the world in a manner that we hadn't seen before. Um, poetry um, exposes things. Poetry should, uh, it's what the world wants when its heart is broken. Poetry is what we use to uh, marry our loved ones, what we do to bury our loved ones. We use poetry graveside. Poetry is what we use when we pledge allegiance to the state. And um, I think that, uh, I think it was Kafka that said, art is the ax with which I break open the frozen sea within myself. And um, Dali, more than any other figure that I can think of, truly believed that that was um, the most important thing about, and the odd thing about Dali is his um, willingness to um, be as realistic as possible and yet put those realistic elements of his uh, uh, painting uh, right up against these completely surrealistic um, landscapes or events or singular moments. Um, uh, just as a, a, a visual artist is cry, trying to create moments of unexpected astonishment, so are we as poets trying to do the same for a reader um, and to try to uncover as much reality as possible by using unexpected associations. Um, I think of uh, Picasso being so much uh, of a an animal that, that uh, he he brought um, he brought us into uh, complete unreality by using African masks and completely moving apart our sense of reality. Dali restores our sense of reality, and yet at the same time he uses Picasso's elements to create something wholly new. Uh, let me read you one little piece from this, and then I want to do a I want to read you an example of a. a surrealistic poem that, that comprises these elements. Um, Dali reaches us at our most basic human level and Picasso attacks our primitive and primordial impulses. 
His African masks are almost absurd in their mockery of human beings. While Dali hopes to enter a kind of delirium while keeping a part of the mind alert to the imperatives of the rational world, Picasso is a conduit, an alchemist, whose open channel to forces of good and evil is messy and even comical. Dali is an astute manipulator of all schools of art, but Picasso stands alone, a rock around which all schools must flow. Dali's mind is such that it lands swan-like on every artistic body of water, scooping some in its respite, and is thus transformed into a human. Picasso arises from the swamp of art as a beast with human characteristics. His subsequent absence in the landscape causes the swamp to dry up. Dali needed God, and he craved the acceptance of a father, even as he poisoned him. Picasso is the father, full of poison, giving quarter to none. Um, so the idea, it's not, um, to me, not a coincidence that two Spaniards sort of uh, gave us the most exciting and interesting um, types of surrealism. Uh, both went to France and, and, and sparked movements uh, when Dali arrived in France, Andre Breton, the poet, said, oh, wow, now we have a weapon of the first caliber. <laughs> and, and they did. Um, and he gave up, uh, changed uh, art forever. Um, I think when you think about uh, French and Spanish surrealism, you think about the difference between Pablo Neruda and Pierre Reverdy, or the difference between, say, uh, Breton and Borges, or Apollinaire, and uh, uh, Lorca. Um, the differences are vast uh, in many ways, but the, the subject matter is, takes up the sort of the same space, but it's used in wholly different subjective manner. Um, I wanna read you a surrealistic poem now from a book of mine called The Lost Sea. And this is called The Diaspora of Stephen Manners. And I'd like for you to listen to the aspects of the poem that seemingly are obvious in the everyday and then how the poem sort of finds a way to uh, nuzzle its nose underneath the rocks and flip them over. Everything valuable that I know, I have learned from women. They have put me together with broken buttons and bits of glass, animal skins and battered hats. I have lain stone beneath their blankets, draped with the madness of celestial telephones at times nourished only on the ether of my grim formulas i was told that nothing would break in here that whatever happened i was ready but god's spies know that sex is violent that the desert panther mad to couple has the strength of ten tribes that sperm rolling inside the rattlesnake is religious as the daughters of lot that i with my eyes of micah was the lesser twin, stranded at the top of the canyon, my sins carefully documented, my body hissing like a watery balloon. There will come an evening, I am certain, while the herds of turtles row toward their death with muffled oars, when the last convertible cruises the beach stuffed with bikinis, and the last sister is held defenseless by her wrists on the wrinkled shore, a fog of men torn on the strings of their own instrument will make a perfect scream of forgetting, their progeny glued like smug honey to the rocks in the twilight of dungeons, passing through the slalom of their automatic doom on skis of meat. Emerald sea flowers will emerge, their heads ablaze in human form, in trying to speak, but then their tortured eyes will meet, cloaked in feathery remembrance of lovers thrown from towers, of loneliness deep as a needle in the scattered engines of sleep, and they will walk slowly together from the Celtic maze upon a crippled street, its pathway littered with marble Apollos, overgrown by the gallows of the beginning.
I'm going to do one last poem, and then uh, we're going to, I'm going to uh, entertain some questions from Helen. Um, uh, thank you so much for being here. Uh, please go to Tom Lowe Books in St. Petersburg to buy any of the books I've shown you, uh, The Skin of Meaning, as well as uh, uh, The Rhythm Method, Razzmatazz, and Memory. Also, if you will, uh, go to our website live at whiterockhall.com uh, to be able to see some of the uh, um, uh, performances and interviews that we've conducted here uh, with poets as varied as Minton Sparks, William Pitt Root, Patricia Smith, um, um, Quincy Troop, and others. Um, and thank you so much for spending this time with us today. And stick around, I'm going to answer, we're going to have a Q&A with Helen in just a moment. Uh, the last poem that I'm going to read is called Blue Mountain Panorama. Um, and I also want to do a little bit of a song before we start this. Uh, this is a song that I think uh, should be our national anthem. Um, oh, beautiful for spacious skies. For amber waves of green, for purple mountains, majesty above the fruited plain, a America, God shed his grace on thee, yes, and crown thy good with brotherhood from sea. feet of Mount Ararat, and I was riding the Lincoln Highway where the homespun Allegheny Mountains meet the non-linear patchwork knobs of the extinct Pennsylvania Appalachians. There were German Dutch and Amish squares, and they were interrupted by the cheese and the chess pieces of the church spires, and there were silent giant windmills spread across the bald ridges like trees without their gown of leaves spinning their mantis arms to catch the flow that fuels the towns. I remember dragging planks up to the thick midsection of the old Fraser Pine, and I built a five-story landing. And that allowed me to watch the world unroll down the valley. And we piled up hardened cow dung clods for games of war in the rotting barn. And barbed wire caught my sister once, biting her wrist to the bone and I knew the blues had spoken. The dirt roads were sprayed with oil to keep the dust down. The naked gourds were broken during pumpkin season, and a juvenile coon riveted a softball-sized ornament on his snout. So eager was he to get it, the sweet meat. So much peace, it seems. But since the sun went dim, nothing keeps the gold plague from approaching, and the blues have spoken to America. The deer population has exploded and the resulting collisions with motorists have strewn corpses all along the road's shoulders. Lazy buzzards ride the wind thermals and circle like fixed gray drones. Inside Tuscarora Mountain, the tunnels are sheer behind the neighboring cliffs and its inhabitants conduct their unseen commerce, coiled tight as a nautilus and their hidden industry enables the rise of the chattering countryside. Their children get the honey, and the rest have grown pallid with violet lips, and they gather together by the river to hear the governor give the news. The blues have spoken, he tells them, and in Newville, where the heart of the Cumberland Valley has begun to fray, the police produce improved tasers, and they practice on targets that bear our likeness. And in this spreading world, 
the mountain removal has begun. Just a little off the top, say the banker's sons. And distant wisps grow into solid smoldering columns of mellifluous destruction, where the last languid strains of smoke have broken loose. And we all know the blues have spoken. Keith, that was terrific. Thank you for that great reading. Um, can you hear me okay up there? Yeah, okay. Um, that was great, and I'm so glad you read that poem. Um, that's one that I had marked hoping to, to ask you to read if you, didn't, if you weren't planning to do it. I like it because it brings together um, so many different things, as we were talking about before um, the program started. You have this way of weaving um, so many images together and a lot of metaphors together, kind of jamming them right up against each other. Um, and yet the poem still, still flows. There's a real vastness uh, to the poems you write. And this poem, like several of them, also weaves in you know, what I would call a lot of politics, um, or at least what I see as, um, as politics um, in this poem. And I, I really love how you do that. Um, I'd like, if you will, to have you talk a little bit about um, the role of politics, given that we've just been coming out of an election, if you could talk a little bit about how you see, or if you see, um, politics as having a place in your poetry. Um, I believe I see it in lots of your poems, but I'm interested especially in the way you go about it, because I don't ever pick up on a sort of didactism in your poems. There's a, a way of doing it that um, talks about issues without um, turning your readers off, at least for me. So would you indulge us in a little bit of a conversation about how and if you see yourself weaving politics into your poems and how you go about it? Uh-oh, I can't hear you. Hang on. The, whoever hosted was, had just muted me all of a sudden. So okay. um, now you're back. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, um, um, yeah, I, and, and I do believe that it's important that every poet have a bit of a um, um, political strain to their poems. You have to be a voice of your time, and, and as a poet, you have to reflect your time. Um, and if you want, uh, and I don't think you do that in a manner that would uh, um, keep your legacy from forming in a hundred years from now people wouldn't understand what was taking place because as a political politics have been around as long as there have been two humans uh, arguing over a, a piece of wood. Um, um, there's always going to be politics. And I think Neruda was one of the poets who had an enormous impact on me. And um, he emerged from the early love songs that were so popular and sold thousands and thousands of copies of his books to becoming a political force, even a senator in Chile. And I think that um, there's a way not to be didactic, but at the same time to address the things that, um, that are taking place in front of us. All politics is local um, and everything is, uh, is political, uh, ultimately. Um, and believe it or not, we find ways to, we're constantly in negotiation with our loved ones. You know, when we, when we get married, we cut a deal and then both sides try to keep their end of the deal. Um, and as you move, you have to negotiate that over time. Um, I think that now more than ever, it's important that we address injustice. Injustice anywhere, as Dr. King said, is injustice everywhere. And um, I'm also, uh, I think of uh, Mark Twain. Mark Twain said, um, uh, you grab a cat by the tail and you discover things that you can find out no other way. And he also said, uh, uh, the difference between the right word and the almost right word is the difference between lightning and lightning bug. Um, it's a matter of lighting down on the right uh, uh, combination of events that reflect uh, pol political uh, concerns, but don't uh, necessarily name them. Um, I learned a lot of that too from the poet AI. Her name is pronounced I, and she had taken on Browning's uh, uh, and extended uh, his concept of the dramatic monologue, and she took on those those things in first person, and she would speak through the mouths of historical figures, 
um, and using her own first person voice. And it became even more poignant as a result. Uh, Twain also said one more thing. Um, I, belong to, I belong to no organized political party. I'm a Democrat. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's funny that you would mention I. I, I love her writing because you know, she has that entire book of all the persona poems. Um, and, I, and I thought of her, in fact, when I read your poem um, that you wrote for Nina Simone, um, Look for Me in Liberia. Um, and then when I went to your website and saw you perform that poem, um, all of you watching need to do that. It's, it's so powerful. Um, and I, I, I think it's a fabulous poem and I really loved it the way you put it to music. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit um, about that poem. I'm kind of interested in, um, it, it, I think the last line of that poem, um, let's see. Yeah, in that poem, I think that's the point that you ask, where do I belong? Am I right about that? So that line can take yeah. a couple times, you say, where do I belong? Um, and then the answer is, um, wherever the edge is free from fear. Um, and I love that. And it strikes me that in some ways, at least to my ear, that's kind of an ars poetica. You know, that, that seems to me that maybe even poetry, that's where poetry belongs, is always at the edge of, um, of fear. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit um, about your own, your own thoughts, about kind of your own ars poetica. To you, what makes a good poem? Where does poetry belong? How do you know if you're reading a good poem? And where do those good poems come from? Wow. Well, that's a, that, that, we could talk about that for several hours, that question. It's a good question. Um, Look for Me in Liberia um, was, um, Nina Simone was an, uh, um, grew up in Tryon, which is nearby. Uh, she was, went to school in Asheville. Um, and um, she was, um, um, she became a political figure as well. Uh, you know, she wrote the song Mississippi Goddamn. Um, she had other, uh, you know, important songs that, that made the top 40, but she was always very interested in the, in the civil rights. And I think that poem reflects that. Um, it's told in the first person. Uh, essentially, um, I inhabit um, uh, Nina's voice and I use lines from her letters, lines from uh, her songs and interviews. And then of course, you know, there are many lines uh, that are my own and that I try to situate inside her, uh, her situation. Um, and um, I, uh, I think a poem, if it's effective, um, really has to contain a, a type of sonic architecture that assimilates its way into the reader's body, um, completely unannounced. And it should be like, um, there's times where you might look at a Dali painting and you think to, and, and someone would think to themselves, I don't know what that means. I'm not even sure I like it. But then suddenly if they walk away and they walk down the street, images begin to look like pieces from the Dali painting. Uh, what has happened is that image has lodged in your, the redemptive force of your imagination. And then your subconscious slowly dress, makes all these associations. You're, you're suddenly, everything begins to look like Dali um, instead of the other way around. And that's how he, he sort of gets mastery over his art form. Um, there are poems and rhythm is the way that rhythm is king. And I write, when I write, um, I, a lot of times I'll have a cassette player in the middle of a, uh, my desk or a table. And as I compose, I walk around and around that table and I'm trying to find the, the rhythm that I think will, will uh, approximate and propel the forward into the reader's subconscious. Um, poetry, uh, uh, the page is a cold bed and poetry has to live in the air. And uh, the way it lives in the air is by creating these um, infinite environments whereby the rhythm can, can stay in the language with a shape, but escape into the reader. There are poems that are slithering around in the ash cans and alleyways in St. Petersburg and around these sycamore groves and through these uh, little trees and streams here in Western North Carolina. And they're trying to find the readers that they were intended for. Mm -hmm. And um, there are, there are a, a tremendous amount of poems being written, uh, I, don't think, I think never before in the history of America uh, have so many poets been writing so much good poetry at the same time. And um, it's a really fruitful thing. Um, but I think what, what makes poetry interesting for me is 
um, you know, the right amount of algebra and plenty of fire. And the fire is the rhythm. <laughs> and so let me follow up on that. I'm wondering, um, because you because you also perform and your songs are so powerful, I'm wondering um, how often you know what you're getting into before you start. Do you decide that what you're gonna be working on, whether you start it aloud, like I love that idea that as you're writing, you're writing aloud. Um, I do that a lot and I ask my, I always ask my students to do that as well, to think in terms of not just revising aloud, but even writing the poem aloud. But, but I'm curious, um, when you start out, do you know ahead of time whether or not you're writing um, for performance or writing for a poem first it'll be a text-based poem even though you may at some point hopefully be reading it aloud um, when is it a song when is it a poem or do you even think about that do you allow them just to blur and come together and just see what comes out um, if you could talk a little bit about how you go about straddling those two um, acts well I, I don't really believe in writer's block um, I think that that's uh, sort of a lazy person's notion uh, to describe a malady that's happened to them that keeps them from writing. Um, and what I try to do is, um, uh, I believe you compose in a flood and edit in a trickle. Um, and because making of poems is an act of love, um, there's no question about that. Um, some people think that, uh, you know, it's an act of ego and it is in somewhat in some ways, artists are, have ego, egos because they believe that they're writing or, or painting or dancing something that has a message, that has something to say, and that you should stop and listen to that. Um, but because it's an act of love and because it's a gift in many ways, um, I think that uh, you know the summoning of these disparate energies uh, is a way for things to coalesce inside a work of art. Um, and it brings together disparate places and then find they find their way once the work of art has been edited properly and fine and, and is finished um, um, like I said you know I it, when you compose you're, you're you're letting everything in you know some of the beats talked about first thought best thought which is somewhat of a bullshit conceit because if you don't work on it um, you know if you don't if you don't take that initial thought and, and work it as far as you can to uh, make it as interesting and as intrinsic uh, to people's lives as you can without cliche or without any kind of um, uh, semblance to something that they've heard or read or written before. Uh, you're trying all the time to be unique. It's hard to be wise and in love at the same time, which is why you have to uh, figure out a way to edit after you've been in love, you know, it's sort of like editing they talk about the Senate in the house and they talk about the Senate being the saucer that cools the cup. Um, and the senators have a way of taking the ribald and, and uh, some SWAT mercenary uh, stances of house members who are only there for two years and the senators who have six year terms, they try to cool down the uh, more um, vociferous ardors of their um, compatriots. Um, I think an editor tries, the best editors try to do the same thing with the poem. They don't want to cool it necessarily, but, but they want to, uh, they, they want it to have a um, avenue of discovery. And that avenue of discovery is, you know, editing. Um, poems are made of words, not ideas. Um, and when you break down the, the smallest aspect of every sentence, then you can begin to think about the sentence in a way that is um, more radioactive. In other words, the more condensation is the final frontier. The more pressure you put on individual words, the smaller the, and tighter and more dense with muscular information the sentences are, the more radioactive they become when they're unleashed into the world. And condensation is that pressure. Um, and learning how to edit sort of takes that place. Um, and, and there are lots of poets who are really interesting creators, but they never, they never cross into a, a manner um, that is constantly aware of how to edit their voice in a manner that creates the transmission to the reader in a way that they can, uh, that's, you know, digest it. Um, I believe that children acquire language to tell the stories that are already within them, that we have a tribal DNA. And what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to create songs or poems um, that uh, 
speak to that tribal DNA so that everybody recognizes us as, as a, a de democratic, uh, long running river of humanity that we all can take a dip in if we just take open our minds enough to do so. And would you say that, is it more in that editing process that you recognize that a poem should be put to music and turn into also a song? Or um, do you have that feeling from the get-go when you sit down to write a poem that this one has a sort of music to it that you feel uh, might be one that you're going to want to perform in that way? I'm just curious how you make that and when you make that distinction. Well, I did, I did sort of not answer that aspect of your question, but in some ways, <laughs> Um, what I what I'm trying to what the, the point I was trying to make is that um, I'm always writing poetry. Poetry is always pouring out of me, mm -hmm. and um, and sometimes um, if I and also, but I'm a novelist right now. I'm working on a novel called The Red Tornadoes. I'm writing the the biography of Rip Torn, uh, the actor who passed away, authorized by his family. Um, I have a new book called The History of Rock and Roll. Um, and I have a book coming out this spring called Prosperity Gospel, Portraits of the Great Recession um, that was a collaboration between uh, uh, photographer Charter Weeks. And um, so that book will have much more of a uh, political aspect to it, uh, nakedly so, but it's also comprised of these little prose poems that are interviews, that are part oral history, that are part prose poems, that are real hybrids. Um, I, there, you know, there's a real hyphen. There's a lot of hyphens in my job description, and sometimes there are a lot of hyphens in the description of what I try to create. Um, I think, in some ways, that, that a hyphen is uh, the most promiscuous of uh, punctuation marks because it'll hook up with anything. But uh, I, I like to think of uh, the hyphen in some ways, in this particular instance, as a way of drawing in all of these elements and making something that's distinctly its own. So to answer your question, um, if I've usually got four or five or six projects going at the same time, if I know that something is very musical and would fit into a song structure, then I, I take it in that direction. If I find myself flummoxed and I hit a, a cul-de-sac, then I stop doing what I'm doing. I pick up, a, I go to another box or another folder, I open it up and I start working on it. If that, if I've reached a dead end with that, I reach in the box, I grab another folder and I start working on that. So uh, it's a way of trying to keep my creative momentum from ever being uh, sidetracked. And um, I'll tell you this one little personal weirdness of mine. I, I struggle every night to try to stay awake. It's very stupid. Um, I never want to go sleep because I'm afraid I'll miss something. I'm afraid something will happen around me that I'll miss it. There'll be an idea that I didn't get down. Or there's something I should have seen that I didn't get. And um, so sometimes uh, I'll, I'll find myself in my best writing moments um, where I'll write three or four hours, I'll sleep three or four, I'll write two or three, I'll sleep three or four. And I get into sort of this sort of twilight um, imaginative state. And it's a way of allowing my body to stay there so that I can finish certain pieces. Um, I don't recommend it for everybody. Uh, not everybody has uh, my constitution, but at the same time, um, <clears throat> constantly being alert, mm -hmm. you know, constantly being aware and constantly being recording the things that happen around you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's so interesting. I, um, you know, even flipping through your book, The Skin of Meaning, I'm struck by, um, by how much variance is in in this particular book i don't know if they're all this way with respect to how the poems are on the page so you not you seem to often be playing with margins whether it's a jagged left hand margin or a jagged right hand margin the point that you read aloud about blue um the um the last longer point that you just read about the the mountains um you know that seemed like it was two shorter lines that overlap creating then a longer sort of panoramic, which I believe was in the title of the poem, the, something about the panoramic. Um, but so th there's a playfulness to your work that I see visually on the page um, and that I really love in what you're doing with all your, your words, your images that just sort of jam up against each other. Um, and you know, it, it, sometimes with other poets I've read, it can almost, it could be too much and harder to follow, but you also seem to strive you know, to, to carry some kind of meaning through, you know, it's just by using more conversational um, words. And there's a, a sort of clarity um, 
that even if I can't quite know how you jump from one bizarre image to another, I love the metaphorical leap. And even if I can't quite connect those dots, I'm, I'm with you anyway, um, because you do it so deftly. So I'm, I am a little interested in where you see yourself in the spectrum between writing um, poems that are clear versus writing poems that are more obscure. Um, where do you see the role of mystery um, in poetry? And I ask that question, especially because you have you have a line at the end of your poem called The Glory Facade on page 33. Um, uh, let's see, the quote, the spool of that life is filled with temporary commotions, knowing that a human being in love with mystery is never finished. Um, and I love that. Could you talk a little bit about the role of, of mystery um, in your poems? Well, only mystery enables us to live. Um, I can't imagine what it would be like, and I think Lorca said that. Um, I, I, I think that um, I can't imagine uh, living my life in a manner where every single day you know exactly what's going to happen. Um, you have a routine that you fall in. I'm very routine oriented and disciplined about creating uh, and where I, when I go to the creation and try to organize what I'm working on. But at the same time, I think, um, you know, too, it, it can be too constrictive as well. Um, I think Creeley said, form is never more than extension of content. And by that, he meant that the lines will, will tell you where they want to sit. Um, and what I try to do is I've, I've, I've never, people sort of talk about me as being a formal poet, though I don't um, really deal in traditional uh, uh, forms, you know, uh, but I'm constantly interested in trying to find my own new forms. Uh, if it's a two ply where two pieces of poetry sit side by side on a page and they speak to one another across the page to, you know, or that you can, you can read them this way or read them that way. Those two plies for me are ways of challenging myself, but also challenging the reader a little bit to think about the poem in ways that are um, uh, multidimensional, not necessarily uh, in one single chronological movement. Um, and uh, because we are multidimensional beings, we live in multidimensional uh, uh, space and time, and poetry should address those things. Um, uh, poetry is language with a form. And I want, like I said, I, I'm trying my best to try to have every single poem have its own form, um, if, you, if, if that is possible. Sometimes, you know, you'll get in a tercet mode and you'll write a few, you'll write more tercets than necessary or quatrains or uh, whatever happens. Um, Ezra Pound, um, I'll say two more things about that. Theodore Rethke said that every single line of a poem should approach the level of a poem itself. Now that is, whew, that is a high bar. Um, but in some ways I understand it because it forces you to think about every individual line in the context of how everything else will work. And a poem is a living organism. If you think it's not, watch three, take three stanzas, Pull the middle stanza out and watch the first stanza and the third stanza grow toward one another like a, like a salamander growing a new tail. Uh, before long you don't miss the middle stanza because the other pieces have, uh, have synthesized themselves into another idea or set of ideas. Um, and I think that's, that's really, really important to think about the poem outside yourself because once you and I write our poems, Helen, uh, and they get outside us, they don't belong to us anymore. Um, People are going to apply their worldviews and their common experience to those poems. And no matter what we intended the meaning to be, um, it will mean something different to every person who encounters it thereafter. Um, so I think that's, uh, I think that's really important uh, way to think about it as well. Um, and uh, form, uh, again, um, I think it's, Ezra Pound said, uh, uh, one last thing, I'll shut up. Um, Ezra Pound believed that once you had poured everything into a poem, you fashioned the stanzas, you had uh, decided what's looked at all the verbs and tried to get more active verbs, uh, you should, and you've got the stanzas fixed, um, you know, you get rid of the gerunds and the participles as much as you can, uh, the, uh, and um, the prepositional phrases that create grace notes, and you get rid of those, and then you go to the top of the poem, and take your first line, you read it, in the second line, you take the first line out, you read the poem as if the first line never existed. And if it doesn't affect the sound of the sense, then it should go away. And then you examine every single line in the poem 
for its worthiness in the poem. And uh, slowly but surely, you'll, that, that, that is a manner of condensation itself. And um, every, every poem has to justify its existence. Uh, and it has to justify its existence one fiber at a time. Sort of like this wall behind me. You see those seams in that uh, uh, wall? Every single line in a poem has to be seamless. And if there are impediments in the poem, typically they're either um, um, psychological or they're technical. If they're technical, they're easy to remove. If they're psychological, that's a little more difficult, especially for young writers, because they get married to their own ideas, right? And you have to figure out a way to get, get away from those ideas uh, and uh, try to create something that you yourself have never attempted before. Right. Constant, constant search, the process of discovery. Yep. Right. Right. And I'm wondering on that note, um, so again, this is a quote from another poem of yours that I like so much. Um, the end of your poem, the poem that's called The Exile, um, you say the map is linear, but poetry is circular and continuous, untangling as it tells. Um, would, you mind, would you mind reading just that poem to kind of, kind of wind us up here? And that's on page um, Well, this, this poem, I was actually, when I was thinking about um, when I wrote that poem, I was actually thinking about the Dalai Lama and um, how, uh, you know, what he had to go through um, when he was in Tibet. And uh, so in some ways, this is his, this is his voice in some ways. Um, and um, the exile. This is my last letter. The first one disappointed in a love triangle has lost the game. Some things upon which I've aimed were undoubtedly innocent, but that is for others to decide. I've tried to rope the world in countless ways and I have done the best I can with tangled prayers and no reprieve. The danger in the beast is its seasons. The morning star enlightened Buddha and his first words formed a poem out of the desperate ardors. Adders made of words, blind as a boxer, striking out at every sound. How do we discriminate? The map is linear, but poetry is circular and continuous, untangling as it tells. Um, that goes back uh, a little bit to what we talked about a minute ago, um, the idea of a human being in love with mystery is never finished. Um, and if poems encapsulate uh, mysterious elements, then I think they have a much better chance of living a hundred years and finding a way, in, you know, that you actually leave a legacy of poems. Um, and I'm not, you know, you can never start out, the idea of starting out to write a poem that's gonna live a hundred years is so ridiculous on the face of it that it seems that it's insane. And because you never know what's gonna happen. We have to be these open conduits um, that allow the voices to come through us. Poets hear voices, we frankly do. And um, under different and weird circumstances, you know, people think that poets are not altogether screwed on right, you know, that uh, their minds are constantly taking on whimsical things that uh, have nothing to do with the real world. When poets, in my opinion, uh, are dealing with the real world more than anybody else, um, because we have to because our, our very existence is, uh, uh, depends upon it. So the idea of learning uh, how to just allow yourself to be that conduit, and, and, and I don't, when I say that, I don't mean, oh, we should wait for our inspiration, you know, to wait for inspiration to strike, um, because I believe that if you, you don't want to get struck by lightning, then you get in a cart and you fill it, you cover it with antennas and you drive into the storm. Um, that's how you get struck by lightning. That's how you, by chance, favors the prepared mind. And I think about um, Jack Nicholas, who hit a shot into the galley, gallery, and um, he picks the ball up and he, he, he hits it out of the crowd and it hits the stick, falls into the hole, and uh, the crowd roars. And one voice is heard above all the others that says, lucky shot, and Nicholas stops. He turns around and he addresses the gallery and he says, the more I practice, son, the luckier I get. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, Keith, thank you so much. It's hard to, hard to wind this up because um, it's such a pleasure to have you join us for the Dolly Poetry Series. And we are very grateful indeed for all the real hard work you do in conveying the world with all of its crazy. So uh, thank you for being with us. And thanks to all of you for tuning in this evening. Um, we will be back with you the second week on the second Thursday in December, again from six to seven at the Dolly um, YouTube channel. So thanks everybody and um, be safe. Thanks. Thank you, Helen.